I want to tell you about my science story. I want to tell you about a story that led me to a project that I think is new, true, and important. And perhaps I'll recruit some of you to join this project. But my story starts in the ocean. It starts with cruises that went from San Francisco to Hawaii, Hawaii to Tahiti. Cruises that went from Woods Hole to the Azores, and the Azores to Scotland. So these cruises were research cruises, which means we weren't concerned about the ship, we were concerned about the ocean. And I, in the days of the 1970s, I, in those days, was part of a small group of research divers that were engaged in diving in the ocean, using scuba techniques to explore the ocean um, underwater, just studying the surface waters. So we launched ourselves into little boats, and we hung a line in the water, and we dove around that line. Now, the bottom may be four or five kilometers below us. That's like two and a half to three miles from the boat to the bottom. So in order to be safe, we attached ourselves to the boat, and we attached ourselves to each other. Now, I could tell you lots of stories about sharks and porpoises and animals made of jelly that we encountered. But what I was studying, I was studying the jungles of the ocean. So like the jungles on land, the jungles in the ocean are dominated by plants. But unlike the plants on land, which are big and have lots of stems and, and, and trunks and leaves, the ocean jungles look like this. Microscopic plants that are usually algae, that fill the water and make it green and fairly opaque. Now, the reason this is interesting for our story is because those particles, those plants, aggregate into particles that ultimately form little microcosms. And these microcosms move through the water. So this is a picture underwater of what one of these microcosms looks like. And it has interesting chemistry and interesting biology. And it moves, it sinks through the water. And what that means for the, the organisms associated with it is that it goes from the warm surface waters to deeper and deeper water that gets colder and higher and higher pressure. Now, we were limited to the upper 20 meters of the water just because of the, the nature of scuba diving and trying to be safe. And we were in the middle of the ocean, so we wanted to be really careful about this. But I had the opportunity to go deeper, to look beyond the diving range, using a submarine called Alvin. So, Alvin allowed me to go way, way, way below where divers can go. And as soon as you get below about 100 meters, about 200, 300 feet, this is what it looks like. It's totally dark. But if you turn the lights on, what you see are similar particles to the particles that I just described to you. Particles that are suspended in the water and aggregated and probably unique in their characteristics of bi biology and chemistry. And they're sinking through the water. Now, the reason this is interesting, and in fact, the old divers, the old submersible divers, the early submersible divers called this stuff marine snow because it looks sort of like a snowstorm moving through the water, and it feeds the deep ocean. So I was studying these particles, and because the particles, as they fall from the surface and ultimately get to the bottom, they go through a temperature gradient, and they go through increasing, increasing pressure. For every 10 meters you go down into the ocean, you increase another atmosphere worth of pressure. So uh, in the laboratory, we had equipment at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I was a student, that allowed us to simulate these high pressures and high temperatures. And in some places in the deep ocean, there were these hot springs discovered, these underwater geysers. And the uniqueness of these geysers, they were called black smokers, and they looked like black smoke, but there's nothing to do with smoke. What this is is superheated water. The water temperatures, because of the high pressure, could reach 450 degrees Celsius. That's, that's like 850 degrees Fahrenheit. And the pressure prevents it from boiling, right? At one atmosphere, that is at sea level, water boils at 100 degrees uh, Celsius. But here, because of the pressure, it boils at very, very high temperatures. So these black smokers were interesting because they're not, very, they're not very common. In fact, they're only in volcanic areas. But what's interesting about them is that there's a whole group of very weird organisms that are surrounding these black smokers and other uh, geysers in the deep sea. And these organisms are taking advantage of the warmth and the minerals coming up from the Earth's crust. 
and they're kind of at a distance, sort of like us sitting around a campfire uh, at night, you know, we're at a distance from the fire and we're comfortable, but if we get too close, it's very dangerous. Well, about this time, it was like 1983, we had a high pressure lab <clears throat> and these hot springs had been discovered in a number of places. And a fellow came to our lab with samples from one of the black smokers and asked us if we could build a high pressure, high temperature apparatus. He asked the question, provocative question is, could organisms live at this superheated high temperature and survive because the pressure prevents the water from boiling? Could that compensate also for the biology? Published a paper with one of the student, one of the postdocs in the lab, Jody Deming, so John Barrows and Jody Deming, published a paper that was really sensational. I mean, it was life at 250 degrees, bacteria, black smoker bacteria growing at 250 degrees. That was a wow. <laughs> because that was more than two and a half times the maximum anybody had ever seen before. And it was very unclear whether this was um, because of the pressure or because these organisms were specially adapted. But you know, I had been studying pressure and I knew the effects of pressure and temperature. And I thought, you know, I don't know if this is true. So I took the same equipment and I did work with the same, uh, the same apparatus that they used. And I published a paper in Nature a few months later that said, possible artifactual basis for black smoker bacteria. In other words, their data was wrong. So, this is okay. I mean, science moves forward by having things that are right and wrong, but it was a case of something that was new but not true. But interestingly enough, this was a turning point in my story because I and many other people who have read that original paper and it, I was directly involved, I thought, you know, this is a really interesting question. What is the upper temperature limit of life? And this led me into a new area in my research. I started going around the world looking at places where there were geothermal hot springs. Places like this in the Russian Far East, Kamchatka, where there's a glacier running into a volcanic caldera and melting and forming these hot acid pools. And we were sampling these pools and looking for life in these pools. They were at they were, this one was 94 degrees Celsius, so it was below the boiling point of water, but it was super hot. And in these places, we found organisms. Organisms that look like this. They're so-called thermoacidophiles. There's about 80 of them in this picture, and they look like little raisins. But in fact, 400 billion of them would fit inside a raisin, an actual raisin, right? So they're, they're extremely tiny. And I went ahead and sampled these organisms around in many places. And really, what I was doing was true, but not new. There were a lot of people who had studied these organisms and much of what I was finding has known already to science. About this time, NASA started a program called astrobiology. And astrobiology was looking for the limits of life to be able to direct our search for life beyond Earth. And so I was a perfect candidate and I went to work for NASA and in fact, I worked on lots and lots of different projects. But I want to tell you about one particular project which is very important in the story that I'm telling you now. And that has to do with the study of Mars. Mars, as you know, is a planet that people are now talking about going to. And we already have rovers on Mars, like Curiosity is there right now. I mean, this is a rover that's rolling across the surface of Mars. It's been there for quite some time already. And it's sending back data. It's sending back pictures of what Mars looks like. This, this is a picture of Mars that was taken from Curiosity, looking out to a mountain called Mount Sharp. Mars is a cold, dry, desolate, really amazing place. It's, the average temperature is minus 60 degrees, average Celsius, so that's like minus 85 Fahrenheit. It's super cold. We still talk, though, about putting people there, even though there's no atmosphere to breathe outside and it's cold. And in fact, the atmosphere is so thin that on the surface of Mars, water boils at 4 degrees Celsius. That's about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. It boils. And our blood temperature is 37 degrees, so guess what? <laughs> There's not only no air to breathe, but your blood would boil and you would freeze if you ever got exposed to the Martian surface. So Mars for me is sort of new, but so what? What is Mars interesting for? And for me, Mars is an interesting problem. Mars is an interesting problem because it's an exercise in thinking about a life support system. 
In fact, on Mars, the waste products from the humans, the hypothetical humans that were inhabiting a Mars habitat, the waste products are more valuable than what Mars will offer us there. Mars offers some solar energy and a little bit of water and absolutely no food. So we would have to put people in a system like this and provide the ultimate in recycling. I mean, this is the extreme case because the waste products from the humans will be more valuable in making food, water, and energy than anything, almost anything we'd find on Mars. This question of food, water, and energy was very important to me on thinking about Mars. And then I had a bit of an epiphany. What about the Earth? What about these same concepts where Mars is a resource-limiting planet? What about thinking about the resource limitations on Earth and thinking about the growing population on the Earth, the problems we have with urbanization and the issues associated with changes in lifestyle, this whole called affluence that's growing in the world, not to mention the fact that climate change is a sort of monkey wrench in our whole system of thinking. Could we apply these same concepts to the issues related to water, food, and energy on the Earth? This led me to a project I call Omega. This Omega project is a system of systems approach that takes wastewater and waste CO2 on a floating platform off the coast of coastal cities to grow microalgae on the wastewater. And this platform is also used for solar energy in the form of electricity and heat from solar concentrators. Wave energy can be the basis for producing power and wind energy also. And because we're in an offshore context, the underwater from this this infrastructure can be used for producing food in an ecologically sound way. We deal with the environmental issues by treating wastewater. We make water from wastewater that's drinkable. And at the same time, we're producing food from an ecological aquaculture. The system provides energy from solar power. And the whole system together is a way of producing green economies that are sustainable for the future. The Omega Project stands for Operational Marinas for Economic Growth and Abundance. It started as a NASA project, actually with funding from NASA and the California Energy Commission, and it evolved. We basically showed that this system is feasible, and in fact, we could, we could build it. There are some issues related to the economics and the energetics, but it's, but it's feasible. We've now started a nonprofit called the Omega Global Initiative, OGI, to spread this idea, to promote this idea beyond NASA. So I started my journey in the ocean. And I took a turn when we discovered something that was new but not true. I chipped it again when I started studying the upper temperature limits of life and was studying things that were true but not new. And then again, when I looked at Mars, and realized that it was kind of a so what? We're never going to colonize Mars. The goal, the place that I've reached now with the Omega Project is perhaps my final project, i.e. the Omega Project. Um, it's new, true, and important. Thank you.